Hi everyone, thanks so much for joining. I am super excited today. I am your host, Mandy Lynn Donovan, over here at Port City Personalities on Rogers TV. Want to give a special thanks and shout out to the guests for the past few weeks. Um, we've certainly been having a great time and a wonderful journey. This week's guest, um, most of you I'm sure know, Dr. Ansar Hassan. Dr. Ansar, as most of you know, um, was in New Brunswick for the last 12 plus years with his family and they've recently relocated um, to Maine and Dr. Ansar will be sharing. We will talk about a lot of stuff. I'm really excited to catch up with him. He's a close dear friend of mine. We will be covering topics such as mental health, um, some tips as well as some tricks and what Dr. Hassan's been doing throughout the pandemic. We will be covering his career, talking about where he started and what led him and his family to the journey now. We'll be covering comedy. We'll be covering some of the many events and some of the many projects that Dr. That Dr. Ansar has his hands in. As many of you know, he's always looking for creative ways to innovate and do more. Um, so I'm very, very excited to uh, catch up with him today and for everybody to hear. Thanks so much, everyone. Let's get the show started. Hi, Dr. Ansar. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hey, how are you, Madeline? Great. Thanks so much for joining. How have you been? Let's start off with that. Oh my God, it's uh, it's been great. I, I'm doing well. Um, loving this opportunity, obviously, to kind of reconnect with uh, my New Brunswick family. Um, as you know, and as uh, many of you already know, um, uh, the, the family and I moved uh, from St. John, New Brunswick, and we moved to Portland, Maine. And um, it's kind of funny, though, because... Uh, you know, when I announced first that we were leaving the regional, obviously, we were sad too, because I mean, we've, we'd spent so many years, we've spent almost 13 years in St. John. Um, our family grew up there, you know, we, as a family had, you know, so many good friends and memories from there. So leaving was not easy. And it was a difficult decision. And we can get into that a little bit later. But one of the funny things was when people would say, Oh, geez, you're leaving, like, where are you going? And as soon as I would say Portland, Maine, they'd be like, oh, that's great, because there's such an intimate connection between New Brunswick and Maine, and so many people choose Maine as their vacation destination, or at least like a, you know, a, along their journey, they stop in Maine to go to wherever it is that they're going to. So I think especially with COVID in full force and the borders having been closed for so long, you know, there was almost this natural like, oh, you're going to love it. I can't, I'm so jealous. You're going to be you're going to be outlet shopping every day and you're going to be doing this and that and which is not the case uh but uh, yeah so we're we've been in portland since the end of august of 2021 and we're coming up to the six month mark uh i know exactly how many days because my laptop keeps reminding me how many days it has been since i've backed it up <laughs> since we left so it's about 170 days on the nose so anyway yeah and this is where we are so everyone's relocated the kids are in new schools and it's it's a it's a whole new world and uh anyway lots to share on that front we thought you wanted to be closer to martin's that's well we hey you know what uh you know you when you should have bought it right and when you saw it and <laughs> yeah. and that's what that's what it was i was like if i can't cross the border regularly to shop i think i'm just going to move there and that's what we did that was really the uh, the primary impetus that's what me, James and Nikki were thinking. And um, so talk a little bit about the move. Um, so you did you know for some time you're going to move? And then um, was it hard for you to make that decision? Talk us through that. Well, you know, so we'd always loved uh, Portland. I think a lot of St. Johners especially love Portland, that whole kind of, new, you know, Maine, New England feel. Uh, and we traveled, you know, to this area a lot. And, uh, but honestly, did not know anything about the hospital, did not know anyone in the hospital. It wasn't like I had this prefab connection. And then one day when, so the, the way the story goes is that after I finished residency in Halifax, Nova Scotia, I went to North Carolina for two years to do a fellowship in minimally invasive and robotic surgery. And when we left North Carolina, we honestly, I did not it was not easy finding a job like as at that time cardiac surgery jobs were few and far between and despite having been i thought well trained and especially in halifax having done both like my cardiac surgery residency and a phd i thought oh my god this should be a shoe in but it wasn't and the fellowship was a good one 
So I was very fortunate because at that time there was a surgeon here at the uh, St. John Regional Hospital uh, by the name of Mark Pelche, who I had worked with uh, previously when I was a medical student. He was my resident at McGill uh, in Montreal. So long story short, uh, he gave me an opportunity to start off kind of as a part-time locum, which is where how I started off at the regional in 2009. And um, so, you know, we were, like I said, we had been there for years, but when I left North Carolina to go to St. John, I set up what's called CTSN, which is cardiothoracic surgery.net. Um, and it's like kind of like a online network of cardiothoracic surgeons. And I set up a job kind of search, you know, say, let me know if there's ever any jobs in. And I picked North Carolina, I picked Massachusetts and I picked Maine. And I thought, you know what, at least that way I know about what's going on in the States. Because my job at the regional was really just a part-time locum. I, you know, it could have evaporated at any point. And so needless to say, once we had settled in, in New Brunswick, I never ever really thought much of that. Every time the notifications would come through, I would delete them. But then suddenly in two, uh, at the end of 2019, this notification came up for Portland, Maine. And I was like, wow, you know, that'd be kind of interesting. You know what, we should at least look at it. And up until that point, we had only ever looked at one other job and never obviously didn't take it. So we looked at it and, you know, the process goes as follows. We start, you know, they were excited because somebody with my credentials was applying and, you know, it speaks volumes of what I was able to accomplish in St. John. And, uh, and they were, they were excited, but then of course COVID hit in March of 2020. And what really kind of started off as this exciting, let's see where this goes, ended in a bunch of Zoom interviews and, and stalled there. They ended up hiring somebody else from the States, uh, from Atlanta. And then, but they were like, you know, we still really want you. And I said, look, you know, call me, but honestly, you know, we're, we're happy here. It's, you know, it would have to be a really good reason for us to leave. But they called back later in 2021. Um, and at that time, sorry, and, and, and later in 2020 and said, look, you know what, we still really want you. What can we do to get you? And that kind of pushed us forward along the lines. And then, you know, and then when, when it came down to it, we thought, you know, what a unique opportunity for us at this stage in our life, you know, with our kids, you know, at that time they were 13, 11 and eight, um, you know, they were willing to move, you know, Danielle and I were willing to move. We thought, you know what, we'll never get this opportunity again to live in this part of the world, you know, which is still not far from home, still not far from friends and family in New Brunswick and Nova Scotia and even Montreal for my sake from my side and but still enjoy this life that could be you know uh and we thought let's just do it and it was it was you know like with anything else right big decisions come with big risks and um uh, and you know we're so far so good but you know we're not we're not you know naive to the fact that you know it's been a it's been a challenging move on different levels and thank you so much for that and so talk a little bit about that was it um, so after your mind was made up and um, the family decided that this was going to be the move that you wanted to make, was it difficult? Because I know you spent your, I know, I know you very well, and I know you're very, very involved in your community. You're very involved um, in, in everything New Brunswick related. So um, was it difficult to say, okay, we've made the, we've made the decision, and then telling, telling your colleagues, telling, um, you know, the yeah. schools, everything like that. What talk me through that? Oh, gosh, I think that was, there was no doubt that was hard. Uh, you know, I, I don't think you can be a New Brunswicker without being a part of your community. I think that's just who New Brunswickers are. That's what, you know, and we were obviously very actively involved, whether it be through our kids on our own, through the hospital. Um, lots of great memories, you know, from everything that we did professionally, academically, also to like what we did socially. And, you know, like, you know, um, I mean, where you and I kind of met up was through the whole comedy world. And, those were a whole slew of other memories, right? I mean, you don't, you don't do Harbor Station with James Mollinger and, and forget about that, you know, for instance, right? I mean, or even the little shows that we did, like from everywhere from, you know, top of the town to, you know, to, to gosh knows wherever it was that we, you know, we were doing them. I mean, the best shows were, I think we're the theater company, but I mean, um, but, you know, we did, I did other great stuff at the St. John Marina, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, it was just a lot of fun times. And, but I think, you know, um, telling people is hard because you, you, there's two things about it. And it's funny, they have the same phenomenon in Maine. They refer to it as the Maine drain. Um, <laughs> I think Atlantic Canadians have always this, there's a perception, there's a little bit kind of like, well, especially like I wasn't really from there. So, you know, that whole notion of, well, you were never really from here, you know, so no wonder you're leaving. I mean, everyone leaves here. That's what people do, right? And I think that's an unfair 
assessment of Atlantic Canada because you know it's not the case. I mean, there's so much that people want to be there for, and we're seeing that now actually. Just like Maine has had a massive influx of people through the pandemic, so has New Brunswick and the rest of Atlantic Canada, right? Because people sure. know that it's a great place to be. It's affordable. It's peaceful. It's less, you know, less crazy. So anyway, long story short, I mean, when I was telling people we were leaving, other than the fact that, you know, people were excited about the Portland, Maine feature, it was sad. It was really, it was sad. And I mean, it was not an easy last few months. Obviously, it was made a little bit better by the fact that we were so busy uh, getting the move, you know, underway. But, you know, we we still miss a lot of people. And I mean, I, I'm still in touch with a lot of people from home. And I refer to it as home. And that's the sad thing is that six months later, I still talk to my colleagues here about what I used to do at home. And I think some of them are kind of like, well, that's not home anymore. I'm like, well, <laughs> it is when you spend 13 <laughs> years, you know, and 13, some of the best years of your life there. So, yeah, it was it was not easy. And um I still, you know, I still very much hold, you know, New Brunswick near and dear. I think my Facebook is still 99.9% New Brunswick, really, you know, other than I think friends from Montreal that I grew up with, et cetera, but it's still, that's the majority of the people that I know on Facebook. I've picked up very few here in the, in the six months here. It's almost like I have like two separate lives. <laughs> that's what it feels <laughs> like. That's the move. Yeah. That's the yeah. move. So speaking on that, talk a little bit about what position did you hold here at the St. John Regional Hospital? And then maybe we can talk a little bit about your research as well. Yeah. And then we'll we'll get to what you're doing now. Absolutely. So I was a um so I, I joined the cardiac surgery department um at, at the St. John Regional Hospital. Uh, it was part of the New Brunswick Heart Center. So that means all things cardiac or cardiovascular go through there, whether it be surgery, interventional cardiology. So people who get stents, you know, for instance, uh, electrophysiology, people who get pacemakers or other forms of defibrillators, um, very strong clinical cardiology group as well. So that was the program that I was a part of. And when I started, like I said, I was, I was a locuming physician. So meaning that you're kind of there, you're part-time. You're not permanent, but you know, I got to that point where I became permanent. It became part of a really good group of surgeons. Um, ironically, two of you know, three of whom are now gone. Uh, one is because they've retired. Mark Peltier ended up leaving for Boston, and then eventually is now in Cleveland. And then of course, and of course, I left. So the only person who's left there from when I joined was Dr. Craig Brown. But all the while, we've recruited all these amazing people. You know, JF Legary, you know, Chris White, Slatko Kozak. Uh, it's a super strong program. And while I was there, you know, I was tasked with two things by Mark. One was to build the minimally invasive program, which is what I had done my fellowship in. So to be able to do some heart surgery, not through a standard open incision, but to do it through a small incision in your, just underneath your, your armpit. So it's called a, a thoracotomy incision. So between the ribs. Um, and then the other thing he tasked me with was because of my PhD background was to start up research or at least add to the research profile that was already there. So thankfully both you know were developed you know uh the minimally invasive program you know was a strong program by the time i left they're still doing it uh dr legary is still quite adept at it and and has has carried that torch um since i've left and one of the things we fought for while we were there was to to get the da vinci robot which was the you know that surgical robotic tool that you know helps us do these minimally invasive procedures so we were going to start that fundraising campaign in 2016 and never really flew uh, with Horizon and with the foundation, but um, but we have, you know, we got a, a, almost approval at the same time that I made my announcement, which is a little bittersweet because obviously there's years of effort. And uh, along with me were Dr. Matt, Matt Acker, uh, who's a urologist, and Dr. Scott Bagnell, who's another urologist. And we kind of led that charge. And now the foundation has taken it on and they are well underway. I mean, I just saw an article that was published on the CBC News yesterday to that effect. Um, actually, it's today. Uh, and it was forwarded to me by Matt. And they're doing so well. And they're raising money for it. In fact, they're raising money for two robots, one here and one in Vitalité at Moncton. So who would have thunk, right? So yay, New Brunswick. Um, so minimally invasive surgery has done really well there. Uh, and I'm proud to say that's something that you know we can offer you know in St. John. The other thing also is the research piece, right? So we built. So the whole thing was, it's like, hey, we're doing great work here. How do we how do we publicize it? So there's one thing to say, you know, beat your chest and say, like, we're doing good work. There's another thing is to publish your results. And that's what we did. We published the stuff that we were doing. And we got onto the map, both locally, uh, both provincially, uh, and also nationally. Uh, and that's where we really made our hay was at the annual Canadian Cardiovascular Congress meeting. 
and we had presented abstracts there and, and suddenly, you know, and that's why we were able to recruit well too, I think, uh, you know, um, we just, we were well known suddenly, like, you know, we went from being a solid clinical program with really great clinicians like David Buick and, 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 um, and Rob Stevenson and others like him, Dave Marr and, and Vern Paddock, and I can keep going on. So our Blitch Media, you know, God bless him. Uh, and, um, and then, and then uh, we were also on the, you know, we were on the map and we were doing stuff academically. So it's just, it's a great center. So there's so much to be proud of. What got you into cardio though? What, like talk about that because that is such a unique discipline. Yeah. I mean, it's hard to say because it's, it, the story is almost not as exciting as it should be. Like a great story <laughs> would have been like, you know, my, my, my dad or mom was like a cardiovascular surgeon of note and I decided to take it on or, um, you know, I was inspired by, you know, a, a trauma in the middle of the night. And really, I, this is how it started. Uh, uh, here's the story in a nutshell. So I was a medical student at McGill, so in Montreal, and uh, I knew I wanted to do surgery because I chattered a, a family friend of ours, Dr. Tala Chuktai, uh, at the Montreal General Hospital. And he, um, and I spent a couple of nights with him and when my pager went off and we had to go to the trauma room, I was, I couldn't have been any more excited. So I knew I wanted to do surgery. Now it's just a matter of what. And so while I was kind of just a medical student who was in a surgical skills rotation is what they call. So you just learn how to sew you, you sewed up pig speed and stuff like that. That's the kind of stuff you were doing. Um, I had free time. So I would go through the operating room at the Jewish general hospital and look for things to do and see. So I'd seen a carpal tunnel operation. That was the one operation I had seen. That's not super exciting, but it is obviously useful for a lot of people. Uh, and you know, what was funny was that on the list was coronary artery bypass grafting. And I thought, oh, coronary artery bypass grafting. That would be so cool. Like I would love I to see a bypass. That. I can't even spell that, let alone well, do I'm that. Sure you but, go ahead. <laughs> but anyway, but the short is cabbage, C-A-B-G. Okay. So that's what it's listed okay. as on an operating okay. list. Okay. And I saw cabbage times three. I said, triple bypass. Well, wow, that's just like on TV. I should go and check that out. Right. Because when I started med school, it was the same time that they had started the show ER. All right. That's how long ago this was. And if you have seen any of the ER shows, there was a cardiothoracic surgeon on there by the name of Dr. Benton. And, and I thought, oh, this would be so cool. I can see what he does, like, but in real. Anyway, I went to go check it out. But the nurse who was kind of and said, no, you know what? Today's not a really good day to go see one, blah, blah, blah. I said, don't worry, I'm fine. She said, I'll find you one day. I'm like, you know, and you sort of think, okay, what are the chances of that happening, right? It's kind of like, you know, it's like, uh, no, we don't have a room for you right now, but maybe if we get one, I'll call you. You kind of assume that you are done with that hotel, you are moving on, right? Anyway, lo, lo and behold, about a week later, I was just walking the halls and then there she was. And she said, hey, I remember you wanted to go see an, an open heart surgery. Are you still interested? And I was like, oh yeah, I am totally interested. And so she said, okay, well, today's your day. Why don't you, have you ever, have you ever scrubbed? I, I, have you ever gotten into scrubs and, and gowned and gloved and all that? And I said, well, I, I did a carpal tunnel. <laughs> and she said, all right, well, this is your shot. Okay, so, and she said, you know, Dr. Langlois, so his name was Eve Langlois. He said, it does not have an assistant today. So you're gonna be the assistant. And I'm like, oh, oh wow. my. Oh my Lord. So this is, I said, perfect. I can't wait. Okay. And then um, she said, you're going to get to hold the heart. So I had this vision that they're going to take the heart out of the chest and I would hold it and it would be beating wow. in my hand. I don't know what clue I had about what I was about to do. I was, yeah. I was more like a person who came off the street than a medical student. I had no clue. Anyway, so I went in there, needless to say, I wasn't holding the heart up in the air. I was kind of retracting it back and forth so you could do this stuff. I sewed the leg closed. And I just had a, a great time because there was nobody else in there. It was just me, him, and the nurse, right? And all the other people who helped run the room. And then he said to me, he goes, what are you doing the rest of the week? And I said, well, nothing. <laughs> he goes, well, <laughs> I could really use a, a hand for the rest of the week. No way. And I was like, that is it. I am sold. And I went there the rest of the week. I, I found an elective in Toronto in cardiac surgery. So I went to Sunnybrook for a month. I came back, did a couple of electives in Montreal, and I was like, this is it. This is my life. This is what I'm going to do. I'm very fortunate to have gotten a residency position at Halifax, Adele, and spent nine years of my life there, met my wife, did a PhD. It was, you know, couldn't ask for anything more. And then, you know, we were pregnant with our first when we left for North Carolina. But that's what it was. That's kind of, and, and here's the funny part of the story. Here's, here's like, this is like, you know, you know, James like to, you know, James has this story, although his is a bit more cool, I think, about how like <laughs> he met the person who delivered him. 
I know, yeah. I know. It's always better. Uh, <laughs> but he met the person who delivered him, right? You know, through yeah, like know. A, a connection in Ross. I know, like one okay, does. All right. So the, that my story doesn't kind of match up to that. <laughs> but what was fun about that is that I, at a meeting in Montreal, met the nurse who actually who actually came out and found me and got me into that room. And I said, oh my God, you know no. that, you know, 20 years later, here I am now a full-fledged cardiac surgeon. I said, it's, it's because you. of you that I'm doing this. And it oh. was very cool. Corinne what Capsaville was her name. Yeah. What did she say? Was she just beside herself? Like oh, she was, was she was thrilled. She was excited because she had kind of remembered me and it was through a common contact that, you know, that kind of connection got remade. And I was just like, you know, I was really just, it was kind of an emotional moment because I was like, you know, I said, you, you don't realize how much, you know, that, you know, I always say to residents and students and anybody who will listen, I said, you know, treat everyone like they're the most important person you're going to meet, right? Because you never know. You never know what connection is going to be worth your while, you know, down the road. And plus, it's just a good thing to do. Um, and I said, you know, I said, you probably didn't even realize it, but, you know, you started somebody off on a career that, you know, and, you know, I've operated on more than 2,500 people and I've done, you know, all this and that and the other. And I mean, look, it's, there's been some good times and some bad times, but the long story short is that I never would have done this. I could have easily just been a, uh, I could have honestly gone on and done carpal tunnel <laughs> releases, you know, or who knows, right? I mean, I, you know, as a physician, you're still going to do something of, of importance or relevance. But the point being, though, is that this particular field, this particular lifestyle is, is in large part thanks to her. And, and uh, so just talking from some of your patients, folks that know you is you're extremely passionate about what you do and, but what you do can be very, very difficult at times too, because you're not always delivering great news. You're delivering not so great news sometimes too. So that must be an emotional process in itself. And we're not speaking specific to COVID just in your overall general practice. Is this true? There's no doubt. I think, you know, it's always great to deliver great news. I mean, who doesn't want to be the, the, you know, the bearer of like, hey, it went really well. And they're just so grateful that it went well. And you're just like, hey, it's just what we do. You know, like that's, that's a, that's a great day. Right. And you see them three weeks later or three months later in clinic, and they're just thankful to have their life back. And that's, a, that's a great time. Um, but, you know, you have to be able to kind of handle the bad news piece. And, I think, you know, it's funny, like when you go back to like your medical, your medical school interview, like, you know, when you're trying to get into medicine and, you know, one of the things they want to try to get at is that, that, that emotional maturity, you know, whether or not you are somebody who can, who can process the good and the bad, you know, who has that bandwidth to be able to manage that side of things. Right. And, and I don't know if like, you know, I look at some of my colleagues and I don't know if they all have it or not, but I have said to medical students that have been with me, I said, you know, how you deliver bad news is almost more important than how you can do a good operation with a good result, of course. you know, and, and, and just being able to kind of connect with, and that's all I try to do is I kind of put myself in their shoes and I go, what is it that I would want to hear if I were them? And, you know, and, and the most important thing that I sort of say to is that first of all, they want to know what's going on, but they want to be able to understand what's going on. They don't want to be in the midst of a conversation that's overwhelming when they're already overwhelmed by the situation. Number one, so it really tries trying to break it down, trying to explain how it is that we got to where we got to, allowing them to process the fact that the negative news is not their fault, right? That it's not because they pushed their mom or dad to have surgery, that this was something that we all agreed upon, like to try to take the burden of what's going on off of their shoulders. And then last but not least along those lines is to say, where are we going from here? Because it's one thing to kind of deliver some bad news, but it's, to, it's more important to know what's, gonna, what's tonight gonna look like? What's tomorrow gonna look like? Where are we gonna be? And I think that's really critical. And I mean, and I try to very much kind of not be as paternalistic as, you know, as sometimes we wanna be, but to try to be just say, hey, uh, look, I don't want you to make this decision by yourself. I'm not saddling you with this decision. We're going to make this together. But, you know, I feel strongly based on experience or my gut that, you know, we have 24 hours or, you know, this is where we're going to end up. And uh, you and I will kind of walk through this together. And then that way they're prepared. They're mentally ready, you know, for the worst case scenario. You know, off, there are times when I'm in an OR and things are clearly not going well. 
And I will deliberately scrub out and not wait for the end of the case. I will deliberately scrub out like, you know, an hour or two before and go and meet the family and say, hey, I just want to let you know that I'm still in there and it's not going well. Because at that point, they're just like, oh, what's took so long, right? Like, hey, tell me, you know, and then at that point, they have a time, they have time to process because there's a big difference when you know that your family member is still technically alive versus, you know, the line has gone flat. And I think these are all the things that I try to think about when you're delivering bad news or when you're trying to connect with your patients. And I think you, if you treat people like you would want to be treated, then I think by and large, you are in a good spot. And look, I've not always been perfect on that front. I feel like I've definitely made mistakes where I could have been better. But then I, on the other side, I feel like I do try to take that time. And the nurses are already so good at it because they're connecting with the family constantly, but we're kind of coming in and out. And so you have to really try to make an impact early. Uh, and the same, but I think it's process. I think, so I think you just said it best. You're not just delivering the news. I think you just said it best. It's you're helping, uh, you're helping with the process and you're also, um, and you're saying we, so a lot, so you're putting yourself exactly in with the family, which I think that that is so, so great. Well, I, thanks. And I appreciate that. And I think it's important. Like I, I'm a big sort of, like, I will off, like, especially if I know that things aren't going well, I mean, the first thing I offer up to them, even, and even if they're not going well, I offer up, I would always offer up a cell, a cell number. And you, you, you know, you automatically think, and when I did that here, there was like, the eyes were like, Whoa, what are you doing? Because it's a very different community here. It's a very different culture. It's like a very more litigious society. You know, you're, you know, your hospital has a risk, you know, advocate and uh, all of that kind of stuff. And we can get into that later. But, um, you know, New Brunswickers are, you know, I never had that abused. It was amazing for the thousands of people that probably had my number. You know, I was never like, or email address or whatever. I never felt harassed. I never felt like I, you know, like I was being taken advantage of. But you know what? I guess, you know, like if not to not, you know, Rogers is kind enough to host this whole thing for us. But Boy, when you call Rogers and, you know, you spend 10 minutes just navigating the ones and the twos and the, you know, and all that to finally get to somebody who's going to help you, there's a frustration level there. And I think, you know, uh, you, you don't want your patients to ever feel that, that they have to navigate through a lot of stuff to get to you. I always wanted them to know that they could get to me 24 seven. And that was number one. And then number two, I think once they know that they have that, then constantly having that inter interaction so that I say, look, you know what, even if you're not sure what's going on, just text me and say, hey, just want to like figure out, you know, where are we at? And then it would just spark a conversation. And I think that made a huge difference. And I'm hopeful that, you know, over the, over the years that, you know, it, it served everyone well, because I always said to them, I said, you know, especially when we knew that, a pay, you know, a loved one was going to pass away or that we were going to withdraw care. I always said, you know, this is going to be hard, but what's going to be even harder is when you, you know, you celebrate his first you know, birthday, you know, since the time of his passing, or you guys have Christmas and there's an empty seat at the table, or, you know, there's the anniversary of his death. I said, that first year is going to be so hard. And I said, you just remember that, you know, there was so much that was positive in his life or her life, and that that's what's going to carry you forward. But that's going to be, um, we talk, look, we talk a lot about mental health, especially now, and you and I talk about that often. And does mental health affect even you? even folks that are in the OR, like, you know, I mean, I would say like, I would say that absolutely. And I think, you know, we'd be, we'd be remiss if we didn't accept that reality of who we are. Um, I had an especially difficult case here and, you know, the long and the short of it, what I was really impressed by was the number of people who actively came forward to check on me, to see how I was doing, like, you know, with, the family and the whole situation. And, and, and I was really impressed, you know, like, you know, there's a lot of words like wellness and health and mental health and personal well being that are thrown around, but they're almost thrown around gratuitously sometimes, like, you know, because we have to talk about them. Like we have to, like, we have to talk about diversity, equity, and inclusivity. Um, but you sometimes worry that there's no teeth behind, you know, that particular saying, but, yeah, I think, you know, it is, it is not easy. And I think as colleagues, you know, we often don't do enough for each other as, you know, uh, to kind of, you know, kind of help each other through. You're often feel, like, even though we were a division of five, like you feel like you're dealing with a lot of that stuff so often on your own. 
like you're kind of, uh, nurses were always excellent. I felt like they were a part of that sort of team and they would help you through it. But yeah, you, um, you know, I would say like, you know, because I had been in one place for so long and I was so comfortable with my surroundings, you know, that you kind of almost forget that, you know, that you, you could have mental health issues or that you could be negatively affected by something. Uh, but, you know, especially since I've come here and you've lost some of that, that social construct around you, you just, you feel a little bit, you know, more alone and you feel a little bit, you know, I guess more vulnerable. Um, and I think we, we all deal with it. We may just not be good at vocalizing it or verbalizing it, but I think we all do deal with it. And we probably don't do enough to kind of look after ourselves mentally, physically, the whole nine yards. Uh, I think that's one of the biggest thing about healthcare professionals. And if you, you know, if you think about like, you know, what's been going on with nurses and other allied healthcare professionals in recent negotiations with government, right. And what they're fighting for, some of what they're fighting for obviously is, is increased pay, right. To kind of reflect the cost of living, but some of what they're also fighting for is just better quality of life. Like they, that feeling like, you know what, I'm tired of getting, because, you know, the intentions are good. They're coming to work to do something good, but you know, that feeling of, you know, being just run ragged because the system isn't supporting them. Uh, these are all things that we have to really take seriously because people are getting burnt out. And that's that feeling. Like, you're just like, I'm so tired. I just want to, I just need a break. And, and it, it's already hard enough what we do. We don't need to make it harder by not helping each other out. And what are some things that you've done um, yourself or that you can recommend some things maybe that have helped you when you get through a tough day? So I think we all can agree that everybody, regardless of your profession, can have an amazing day and then also have a more challenging day. So I know that you surround yourself with family and friends. I know that that's something you and me always talk about is being around the company, um, around your company. But what else, what are some other things that you could recommend to folks um, with Wow. Health. I mean, I, I'd probably be the worst person to recommend anything because I'm, I'm an <laughs> example of what you probably shouldn't do. I think, you know, and I'll, I'll share that willingly. I think, yes, I mean, I've been very blessed with a, with a great family and, and many great friends. And I think what you kind of do is you, you shift gears. And I think as, as healthcare professionals, we do do a lot of that where we kind of shut one part of ourselves off in order to be able to then be functional in our next, you know, in our next set of things that we are tasked with doing. So as soon as you get home, you kind of, you can only wear what you're experiencing at work so much. You need to kind of, you know, your kids need you, you know, your family needs you. Um, and you almost have to internalize a lot of what it is that you're coping with or dealing with, right? Um, and then of course, when the call comes through and you got to deal with something from work, then you can kind of shift back and forth. Um, I think, you know, if I had to do things a little bit differently, I, I think that the thing I would really want to do is open up the lines of communication with colleagues and take the time because oftentimes, oftentimes the thing we don't have any of is time and say, hey, you know, that was a difficult case. Um, you know, you want to talk about it. Is there anything that we can do to, you know, um, and, and do it in a way that's not, you know, not malicious. It's not like, oh my God, are you trying to, are you trying to figure out something, you know, that will render me unemployed or, you know, will render me demoted or anything? No, this is, it's a, it's a non-threatening, Hey, what can I do to kind of help you out? Is there anything, you know, do you need a couple of days off? Like we would never say that, you know, I actually had somebody say that to me here recently. I said, you need a, you, you need a couple of days off to kind of, I was like, what are you talking about? A couple of days off? Like, what do you, uh, you know, and you're a part of you is like, I'm not that weak, you know, I can handle this. I'm good. Like, you know, but you don't ever, because it's a sign of weakness, right? And, and I think we don't do that well as, as physicians or as healthcare professionals often, we just kind of keep motoring along. Right. And I and, think it's a and, shame. Yeah. And I think we need to do a better job of helping each other out because at the end of the day, who understands better what we're going through than people who are exactly trained in the same ways that we are. Yeah, and there's so many folks, if it, it's, it can be the smallest thing. If you go through a drive-through, so many folks, uh, and I challenge any of the folks watching right now, uh, if you're in a drive-thru, say, how are you today? You'll be surprised at the response of how many folks will say, wow, no one's asked, asked me that, or they're thrown off so or how are you feeling? Or take that extra minute to acknowledge uh, the person that did the smallest thing. It might not seem like it's a lot, but it is, 
and it can be a lot to folks. So just being outside of your bubble or so to speak for a minute, but it just kind of lets somebody else know you appreciate them or thanking them um, for something, even if it was something small, it's it, a little bit can mean a lot. And I know that's something you and I talked about a few times, which is, um, you know, the smallest things or uh, the, like, the smallest thing can make a difference. It could be the well, biggest difference in somebody's life. Absolutely. And I mean, I, I guess I sometimes take for granted, like, you know, yeah, you don't want to sound kind of conceited or pompous, but, you know, we're in, I'm in a position where, you know, as a physician, you sort of, as a surgeon, you know, people sort of kind of give you a little bit of a space where they kind of say, well, you're the surgeon, that's what you do. But when you reach out to anyone and everyone at the hospital, and, you know, you say, hey, good to see you again. How's it going? Like, you know, and like, you know, kind of, uh, you're right. I mean, that little bit, like they just light up, right? I mean, from like everyone from like the porter right up to, you know, the, the administrative staff, right? I mean, you just, I think it's important to connect with people in a way that makes them feel human. And that also makes them feel that you're human and that you're not just a robotic surgeon, no pun intended, who's, <laughs> you know, whose job is to kind of just, you know, crank out care and make lots of money and go home and spend it. Right. I mean, I think there's more to us than that. And, uh, I'm proud of the fact that, you know, at least in your Brunswick, I mean, I felt like we were surrounded by a lot of people who cared, um, but, you know, we could always do more. And I think that is that especially is something that resonates with me now more so than ever, especially during these times where if we don't look out for each other, then nobody else will. And then you're sort of you're going to be left high and dry. Well, one of my one of my favorites is and we'll shift a little bit on that. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Ansar is. Um, um, one of your, one of your patients, uh, uh, family members said one time, um, cause you did comedy for a bit as well, helping out because it's just other than emceeing other than everything else you do, it's just another branch or faucet of you giving yeah. back to your community and making folks laugh. So, um, you're incredibly talented in the comedy world. You already know that that's not a secret. It's not, um, saying anything else other than, um, you write about stories that are funny, uh, also that resonate with other folks, but, my very favorite is one of your when we were at when we were doing a show I think you James and I and um uh one of the folks said he saved my son's life and he said and also he made me laugh so hard tonight he said what can't this guy do and I don't want to think <laughs> like I'm trying to give you a big head or anything like that but oh. I mean talk about the comedy why is why you already had such a big portfolio already why was doing comedy um and helping folks laugh and smile a little bit important to add to your portfolio you know I think it's a kind of comedy was a natural extension of who I was it wasn't so much like it was something I needed to I think you know if I took on um you know playing guitar I think that would be a real shift <laughs> comedy I think was a little bit always who I was I was uh, blessed to be uh, a part of a family where uh I had, a, you know, my dad is, is funny naturally. And he kind of inspired me, I think, to just, I, there was a sense of humor that he had. I don't even know how to kind of, you know, characterize it. But I think, I think a lot of my sense of humor sort of derives from him, or at least it allowed, there was a, there was a space at home that allowed me to be funny. And of course I would carry that on to school and who knows, maybe like sometimes, you know, I, I'd be curious to see like, you know, what comedians talk about, like, you know, as far as their drivers for, you know, because they'll often say, well, why are you, you know, like, who's your inspiration? And I said, well, no, nobody really, other than the fact that, you know, we were allowed to be funny at home. And I'd love to hear what like James and Travis and, and Jimmy <laughs> McKinley and all those people would have to say, right? Because um, I think, you know, like it was, I had that opportunity to be funny at home. I had the opportunity to be funny at school. I think a lot of people like they use it as a way to kind of gain a little bit of an in. Uh, Cause you're like, like you get that positive that. feedback, right? You know, you're, you're kind of the class clown or you're a little bit goofy and you can say stuff and, and people laugh and you're like, that's, that's my, that's my guitar. You know, that's my, that's my singing voice or whatever it is. That's my art form. And so I always had that. And I mean, naturally, I think I enjoyed, I still remember we were at like some kind of a, a, a party and, uh, and it would just kind of happen where I would start to kind of, I wouldn't realize it, but I'd get it almost like into a bit of a, like a set of sorts. And, you know, my friend who, who knew me from like, from like when we were five, he would be like, oh, there he goes again. You know, like you could just tell, like, you know, you were off and running. And, and so anyway, I think humor has always been a way that I've been able to break the ice. Um, I use it a lot in medicine with my families and with my patients to make them feel comfortable, to make them feel like, hey, you know what? It's okay. Like, this isn't all gloom and doom. Like, 
this is serious, but at the same time, don't worry, like we can have fun doing this. And I think they enjoy it. Um, and then last but not least, you know, when I was able to take it to this level of going on stage, you know, uh, I mean, so all of that was wait. But before before you talk about that, when you went on stage, so that's a totally different audience than what you have in the OR. Okay, so you're expected to, as Nikki tells everybody she trains, you're the boss there. You go out, you deliver. You have one job, and that's to forget everything else in your life at that moment. Yeah. And you have your job is to make everybody in that audience have a great time. So if you translate that to surgery, then. Um, your job is to make sure the outcome is the best that it can be and that you've done the best job that you can. Does that translate like talk like how does that does it ever intertwine that kind of um, oh, 100%. Feeling or... I think the two jobs were not dissimilar. I think people often thought they were completely Agreed. dissimilar. But you're right. I mean, absolutely. They were completely intertwined in many ways because, yeah, I was able to go up on stage, you know, with, you know, with a um, with the support of, of uh, you know, friends and and family and do that. Um you know, and, and that was great, but I still remember, you know, James and I met at a Wendy's before I did my first show ever at the theater company. And I kind of said, you know, he was like, write a set, you know, and it went from like, oh my God, like, this is going to be exciting to, oh no, <laughs> like, what do you mean write a set? And I still have all my sets, like every, every one that I did was, which was all, they were slightly different here and there, you know, I have every single one uh, still. And and I remember I kind of shared it with him and he goes, this is good. This is going to be good. I would change this. I would do that. I was like, all right, sounds good. And then of course I rehearsed it up the, you know, up the wazoo before I went on stage and course, delivered it. You. And then, and that was the beginning. But having said that, the, the, the thing though, is that it is one thing to, it is one thing to kind of deliver material in front of an audience. It's another thing to put it together. And I think that's the piece that people often overlook because, and you know, you've written sets too, and you've gone and delivered it and, you know, I think it's just, there's so many facets to that. And it be, you know, so if you want to talk about the OR or the hospital in general and being able to control the room, right. As a surgeon, you do the same thing there. It's like, you know, all right, I, all right, I've written all my material. I know what case I'm going to do. I know what I'm going to say. And then you got to go up there, but then you got to make sure you deliver it in a way that you resonate with the cues of every, you know, like, because what if, you know, what if you think something is hilarious and then you, and then you deliver it and it's like, it gets mediocre laughs, right? Which happens, happened, you know, and you'd be like, oh gosh, all right. That was going to be my big moment. Right. Yep. <laughs> and and that didn't happen at all. Like, so the rest of this is garbage. Why who's going to, who's going right. to laugh at the rest of this, but then the rest of it suddenly became better, but you also kind of, you shifted on a dime and you started to kind of improvise a little bit, you know, deliver it with a little bit more oomph. You know, you, and I think there's no doubt, like, you know, similarly in the OR, you're working with a lot of different people and you are responsible for the mood in that room. You're responsible for the tenor of that operation. You, you were similarly as a, as a stand-up comedian, you were responsible for that tenor in, the, in, that, in that audience. And uh, I think, you know what, it was not stress-free. I mean, writing that stuff and going right. up there and then <laughs> delivering it and then always wondering, and I'm sure others can relate to this, I was wondering if you were suddenly going to fall flat. Like yes. if you know what, yeah. like if you yeah. were, if this was just going to be the finally the night where the bubble bursts and you were going to be a bust. <laughs> now, St. John's, New Brunswickers as a whole, that fan base, I don't, I, I'm embarrassed to call it a fan base because, you know, I don't <laughs> pretend like I've got fans, but uh, gosh, they're loyal and they're super, they're super supportive, right? They are. But having said that, it was always a concern that if I ever, you know, veered off and I just wasn't funny so here's a, here's here was my trick I said there was two things I wanted to do one was to be funny obviously and I typically took stories to kind of like I was a storyteller type to kind of you know make sure that and then the other thing was to be and, and by storytelling I wanted to be relatable I wanted people to kind of be able to kind of listen to they go even if I'm not like ha -ha, laughing uh, at least I'm enjoying the conversation that I feel like I'm ha having with the person on stage, right? So that's number one. So that's why I never was crude. I was never this. I never needed to be. I just like, I'm just going to find real stories and I'm going to tell them, right? And it's amazing, right? Like when you start doing the stuff, like the stuff that you find funny is that's what makes a comedian a little bit different than the average person is because you find a lot of things funny that people don't necessarily look at and go, that's hilarious. And you find a way to make it funny. The other thing I also wanted to do was I go, what a unique opportunity, what a stage that you have. I wanted to make sure that if I was going to be talking about stuff, it was factual, it was relevant, that I actually did research, that I wasn't just like making stuff up. 
I wanted to make sure that I got stuff like that was actually like true. So, you know, I wanted to talk about, you know, when it was that, you know, Canada actually officially okayed gay marriage, you know, and, and when it was that, you know, the states did and how much further behind they were. And, and I wanted to talk about religious differences between Muslims that I am and, and others and, and do it in a way that was funny. But at the same time, when they went, when they left, they go, Hey, I kind of learned something of that too. I laugh, but I just realized I kind of learned something about, you know, whatever it was that, you know, he was talking about. And I think that was the key. And I felt like the audience that I always had was a very mature intellectual audience. And, um, and, and they were always the people who kind of appreciated that. And I think what they liked was the fact that they were being spoken to, like, you know, somebody who, who was, kind of an equal, you know, who, who was treating them like an equal. So it was a lot of fun, but I think, you know, the same, if you want to connect it back to the OR, it's the same principles really at the end of the day. And the OR was always great because I could be that storyteller in there and we could talk, but at the same time, we could do something that was very important. Um, and it was, it was such a great spot because they were, they were super receptive. Um, and uh, yeah. And I think the, the, the two jobs were not that different. But then also, it's not just for anybody that's watching or listening. It's not just um, those two things. Also, emceeing. So you're you're an amazing MC also. So that's another thing that you do in addition to that. Uh, you um, bare naked ladies, I think you emceed for them, didn't you? In uh, Heart and Stroke, you did Heart and Stroke. It was Stephen uh, Page, yeah. No, I mean, Stephen it was Page. Stephen Talk Page minus the rest of the bare naked ladies, yeah. Yeah, that's fine. That's still good. I had the bare naked part. I just forgot. But okay, so so you MC there. So. Uh, and you've done several other events. This is just the first one that came to my mind for whatever reason. Yes. I'm like, let's think 2015. Um, but uh, <laughs> uh, talk about that because emceeing is another portion of it. So there's, these are three completely different things. So it seems like you're just somebody that wants to try to take on something new. And then uh, I, and I feel like, I almost feel like uh, it's, uh, you're doing this also for yourself to uh, make yourself better. And um, I, I still remember, I don't know, four or five years ago, we were all sitting around um, talking after a show. And I remember uh, uh, you talking about being outside of your comfort zone when folks are doing these things, how they're creating more, how they're doing more things. Talk a little bit about that, because it seems like you're somebody that um, is willing to do those things and put the work in, which is obviously the most important part. I think it's always good to challenge yourself. I think it's always good to push yourself, you know, um, and, you know, it can be within your profession or outside. It doesn't mean that you have to pick up a paintbrush and suddenly become artistic or um, you have to pick up a guitar and become musically, you know, gifted. I think the truth of the matter is, is that it's always good to kind of say, all right, where am I at today? And where do I want to be in one or two or three years? And sort of say, okay, how much further is that from where I am and how do I get there? And I think, Part of the move for us, you know, we call it an adventure. We call it an exciting time in our life. But the truth of the matter also is, is that I sort of said, okay, if I was to stay in, in St. John, well, this is kind of where I see myself in five years, you know, what potential exists if I, we were to go to Portland, Maine? And that was part of it, right? And I think that's that's the thing. It's, 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 it's always a good thing to kind of push yourself. Because I always said to people at home, like I, you know, St. John home, I said to them, I said, look, you know, if I come back in three or four years, maybe you never know. Um, I feel like I would be totally better than I was when I left. I'll have picked up new things. I'll have picked up new ideas. I'll have pushed myself on different fronts and I'll be a better person for it. And I think we all will be a better, you know, family for it because we'll have become more worldly and we'll have a different, you know, mindset. So I think, you know, emceeing, doing sets, you know, like all of that was just a representation of my wanting to be out there not being afraid to go out there, but also, you know, saying, hey, you know, what can I do now that is a little bit outside my zone? Because now, now I can say I've done that and I can do it well. And then I move on to the <laughs> next thing. And it was a lot of fun. I mean, geez, those hard, those hard truth galas, you know, through hard and stroke were just magical at, at the Moncton Casino. And I, you know, got to be a part of a lot of great acts, you know, like, you know, just amazing musicians, you know, that were there world-class musicians, but at the same time, I got to get on, go on stage in front of 1500 people and put yeah. something together that, you know, not only was I proud of, but the heart and stroke was obviously happy with and wanted me to come back. And I think yeah. COVID put a premature halt to a lot of that sort of stuff, you know, but maybe that was good. Maybe I had a great little run and now I can kind of move on to something else. But, um, 
it was it was a lot of fun and i think you know i'm really appreciative of the opportunities that i've been given i think that's where new brunswick was just so magical you know i can't imagine i would have had any of those opportunities if i had taken a job in toronto for instance you know where i think you know my opportunity spectrum would have been so much smaller in the grand scheme of things because it's just you know new brunswick really was my wife and i talk about this you know new brunswick you know you could be like a bigger fish but the pond was so much smaller that it really celebrated anybody who was wanting to step it up always kind of, always right i mean it was that's that's what new brunswick is all about and you know, I could go like, I mean, my, one of my days that, you know, that I remember clearly was I had a meeting in the morning um, with the, with the premier of, of, uh, of New Brunswick uh, right. at the time. Uh, and then literally went from there, it was, um, you know, and went from there and then uh, drove back from Fredericton and operated two cases and then did a show at the theater company. You know, when, when are you ever, I mean, I must admit that may not have been my best show at the theater company, but right. when are you going to ever get that opportunity right you know ever in the grand scheme of things because you know you're just it's it's incredible like you know what you could do over there and what they you know what they would what they would reward so to speak you know and, and that's you know so i'm so fortunate but it's true it's true testament to you also so where you could say all right i have my career and that's enough and i remember after one of our shows um somebody saying how uh, cleverly funny you were and then James said oh yeah he also does surgery sometimes too <laughs> like right, you were known for this piece of you and not just said hey once in a while he can do a surgery <laughs> like it was just like it was just incredible to hear that instead of like what do you think about that like because it's you being known from some for something different right and oh there's well, no doubt it was it was a real thrill fun. to like, kind of have that recognition uh to have gotten good at something else because you know obviously my life up until that point had been predominantly medicine driven and now to be able to do something else and of course you know like you're trying to figure out okay to what extent am i being told that i'm good because it's you know people are nice versus yeah. how you know how it is that it actually is right but you know when you got to perform with you know some really great people um you know, like Andrew Albert, who was one of them, for instance, you know, and I remember he said to me afterwards, he goes, you know, I really like the way you put it all together. And I'm like, wow, that means a lot coming from somebody who can bang out a one hour show in no time flat, you know, you know, once yeah, again, God bless him too, incredible. right? I mean, he was incredible. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it was just, there were so many really kind of neat people uh, that I got, I got a chance to perform with who were so established and so well crafted. And to be a part of that same stage and to kind of be treated, I guess not like, um, but to be treated or considered a, an equal or to be considered like somebody who was legit, not just somebody who happened to have gotten in because he was a doctor who, oh, this is kind of cool. Let's give him a chance. Right. So I think it was, it was neat. And I, I'm proud to say that, you know, a lot of these connections have lived on and uh, it's really nice. Like, you know, um, it's, 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 it's a nice feeling that because that's like at least five plus years removed. Yeah. And so, um, and we'll wrap up here just in a couple of minutes, but so we talked about, I want to make sure we, cause there's just so much of you and hours never enough, but, um, <laughs> so we cut, we covered research, we covered your move, we covered, um, mental health. We talked about some great, um, initiatives that are happening right now, even in your absence that you're still following along that you're obviously extremely passionate about and new Brunswick. We talked about, um, I think, um, if, if what, what am I missing right now? Like what else could we, could we cut? Like, do you think that we, the list listeners or the viewers should know? Well, I think, you know, I think people will naturally be interested in whether or not, you know, the U.S. is all that it's cracked up to be, right? Mm -hmm. And, and, and that, is you know, it? is it, is it uh, well, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I think, you know, at the end of the day, I think if I had to put it this way, I would say, number one, uh, I think New Brunswick bats well above its weight. I think it does a great job. Uh, could it do things better? 100%. Uh, but we all could do things better. Uh, the U S is, uh, it's early to say, because I'm only six months in, right. I mean, I can't really speak to all of the facets of the U S healthcare system or U S as a whole, but I will say this though, that, you know, there are a lot of things that we could hear at the, in the, in the United States learn from Canada and vice versa. And I think the, the best system probably sits somewhere in between. Right. And, uh, but I will say this, I mean, uh, I have not left St. John feeling like, wow, I thank God I got out of there. Uh, but rather it was like, wow, what a great place. And I continue to kind of tell people about what it is that we did there and that we could maybe do here, you know, to make it better. And it's, I think that speaks volumes of 
St. John, the, the, the healthcare system, St. John, the hospital, St. John, the city. And I think, you know, it's a, it is a great place. So, you know what, uh, maybe sometimes you need to leave somewhere to recognize how, you know, much you really miss it. And maybe that's the case, but we definitely love going back. Uh, we've been back once um, under slightly different circumstances, but, you know, we're hoping to come back this summer and just kind of spend time with friends and, 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 you know, and, and all of the above, but yeah, that's, I think that's, that's the only other thing that we could probably potentially touch on. And that'd be another topic for another day. And, um, and, but man, well, it's, uh, there's, yeah, there's just, there's a lot in this world. And I think COVID is weird because it, it's, it's been such a, such a hard thing for us to navigate uh, over these past years and, and has, you know, siloed a lot of us, but at the same time, we're doing this because of Zoom and, because of what we kind of developed as a result of COVID. So guess what? The world's a smaller place and we're all really still in it together. So we're still connected. So you're saying that uh, we're still very much connected, even though we're in different places. Is that? Oh my God, exactly. Like, I mean, I feel like, uh, I, you know, I, I, I look, there's a lot of things that are probably negative about social media and all of the, you know, things that go with it. But sure. uh it was because of, you know, you posting about, you know, all the great guests that you've gotten on your radio show that I kind of, you know, sent something back to you and said, you know, I'm so excited that you're doing that well, you know, like, I'm so proud of you. And I thought, I, you know, and, and one thing led to another and you thought, well, hey, guess what? I've got this going on and would you be interested in coming on? And you know what? It's been super exciting. I've been excited about this particular date for quite a while. And it's kind of a chance to kind of talk to all my friends in a, in a slightly different way. And yeah. So you know what it is it is a small world and i i you know in some ways we feel like we've never even left except other than when we look out the window and we realize that's not our home in ross and new brunswick but uh you know what in many ways the world's a smaller place and uh i think that part is good i just i hope that all the other negative stuff that's emerged from the pandemic you know the things that have isolated us that have separated us from loved ones I hope we can kind of overcome. I, I I know that there's a lot of angst over, you know, certain mandates and and all of those kinds of things that are keeping people away from what it is that they want to be doing. But I, I you know, the disease is also a real thing, and and I mean, it's it's been a struggle figuring out what the best way is to fight it. And you can be rest assured that it's not that different down here. Actually, yeah, some of the rules see, may seem a little bit more lax on you know on 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 TV, but there's a lot of things that we're dealing with here in the hospitals and all that. It's not fun and games, uh, but you know, for everyone's sake, I hope that we can get past this and move along so we can actually all physically be together. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Everybody, we're joined today by Dr. Ansar. Thank you so much for tuning in to Mandy Lynn's Port City Personalities here on Rogers. We do appreciate it. Thank you so much for your time today. It was such a pleasure to spend this time with you. So nice to see you and connect with you again. And we can't wait till you come back home again. Thank you. Absolutely. My pleasure. And thank you so much for having me. Thank you.